Hello, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to the Invasive Species Center's Asian Carp Canada webinar series. My name is Rebecca Schroeder, and I'm the Aquatic Invasive Species Liaison at the Invasive Species Center, where I manage our Asian Carp Canada program, and I'll be your moderator for today. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you today from Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, home of Garden River First Nation, Batchewana First Nation, and the Métis Nation. The Invasive Species Center is a not-for-profit organization that connects stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. We have a lot of great invasive species resources on our website that includes in, uh, invasive species profiles, best management practices, and a lot more. You can even sign up for our quarterly newsletter, our uh, bi-weekly media scan. So if you want to check us out at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca, you'll find uh, a lot of great stuff. Oops, my keyboard just kind of went crazy there. There we go. So Asian Carp Canada is a program of the Invasive Species Centre and it was created to bring together information on the most recent prevention technologies, early warning measures, response efforts, and the overall threat of Asian Carps to the Great Lakes and beyond. The project components aim to enhance education and knowledge of Asian Carps and we do this in partnership with many agencies across Ontario. We also have a lot of great resources on our website uh, www.asiancarp.ca. You can check out previous recordings of our webinar series, species profiles, we have summaries of risk assessments, um, we also have some social media channels, and we host information sessions, and we have an, an exhibit at the Toronto Zoo, just to list a few things. So before we get started with today's webinar, um, there's just a couple of housekeeping items that I'd like to mention. We will have time for questions at the end of the webinar, so if you have a question at any time, please type it in the question box, and at the end of the presentation, I will read it out loud to our presenter, uh, where he'll be able to answer them for you. If you're having any technical difficulties, you can also type those in the question box that I'll be monitoring throughout the webinar, or you can email me, uh, which you will find in your registration email, and I'll do my best to resolve it for you. And last but not least, there will be a very brief survey following the webinar, and if you could take some time to fill it out, we would really appreciate it. And now for our um, presentation, I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Kevin Irons. With nearly 30 years of fisheries experience, Mr. Irons began his career as a biologist studying all native and invasive species on the banks of the Illinois River. For the past 10 years, he has developed the Illinois Department of Natural Resources highly regarded Asian carp program, coordinating these efforts with state and federal and Canadian partners to procure and anchor a multi-million dollar response to protect both the Great Lakes and Illinois' waters. Kevin is a national voice in Asian carp management who has been invited to share his expertise with leaders throughout the globe. In addition to countless interviews via a variety of media, he has also authored over 50 articles in peer-reviewed literature. This past spring, he was promoted to Assistant Chief of Fisheries, but maintains his other duties while a national search is underway. He represents Illinois in various regional and national invasive species venues, including the Great Lakes Fish Health Committee. He is also a national member of the American Fisheries Society, was past president of the Society's Invasive and Introduced Species Section, and served as an authority on fish health for the state of Illinois. Kevin earned his bachelor's degree in biology from Northland College and completed graduate level courses in fisheries at Michigan State University. So thank you so much, Kevin, for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Thanks, Rebecca, and greetings um, from central Illinois. I'm in Delavan, Illinois, working from my basement office as we all are working in new conditions uh, since early last year. So I, I trust everybody's well. Um, one hat I guess that, that I didn't put in that short bio was uh, I serve on an aquatic invasive species uh, task force for the Great Lakes governors and premiers. So also I keep myself pretty well in tune with the needs across the Great Lakes. Asian carp is one of those needs. And I've tried to put together about 30 minutes worth of discussion on what we're doing in Illinois to keep the fish from the Great Lakes. Um, but it's not everything. So uh, if you have a question, please let me know and, and we'll, we'll go further uh, in that direction. I am trying to advance the slide. Just try clicking down and, and then seeing if you can do it. 
not I can advance. Yep, I lost the, the link somehow. So if you would please advance the, oh, right. the slide, I'll go from there. No problem. Sounds good. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, first, you know what? What are Asian carps? I think we need to start at a at a initial ground level, so everybody's on the, the same uh, page. But Asian carp are four species species of fish from uh, largely Asia, China, uh, big head carp, silver carp, black and grass carp. Uh, generally, in, in this talk, um, we'll be referring to big head and silver carp as the uh, the topic du jour. But uh, nonetheless, there are multiple species in North America. <laughs> Apologize for my audience. Um, these are most cultured and consumed, uh, one of the most consumed fish in the world. Uh, they were imported into the, the U.S. in the 1960s and 70s that deliberately uh, to improve uh, conditions in aquaculture farms, but, but quickly escaped. Um, they're now established in our major U.S. rivers, uh, those of the Mississippi River Basin that, that includes the Illinois, the Missouri, and the Ohio. Uh, next slide. So why did we bring these guys here, or gals? Um, basically, it's kind of a response to the, the rise of the ecology movement. Uh, so a book by Rachel Carson, um, I'll say back in the day, wrote Silent Spring to really talk about those issues that were coming to the forefront there in the uh, late 50s and 60s that we recognize uh, around our wetlands, things are being very quiet. The, the frogs are disappearing, insects are being quiet, and the springs were frankly different. Uh, at the same time, at, obviously because of the use of chemicals to control these things and, and, and on the landscape. At the same time, you know, we're starting to think uh, that biological control is, is a more green, more effective way to do this without killing off uh, nature around us. Um, the UN, uh, US EPA, Fish and Wildlife Service started encouraging the use of um, biological controls for uh, controlling algae in, in water sources. And uh, so the, the request for first grass carp to control nuisance aquatic vegetation in these systems, but then big head and silver carp um, then in the mid 70s uh, was done. Uh, and, and right away it was recognized as an excellent food animal. So it was always thought that while it provided ecological benefit in those systems where they're raising probably channel catfish, there was a secondary uh, uh, gain to be got here of a, a, a quality food fish that could be harvested and increase the uh, economics of, of those resources. Uh, next slide. So here are the Asian carps and as a fisheries biologist I have to admit we're, we're somewhat simple and I say that but but truly the, the fish on the top that is is very silvery perhaps more than the others that's the silver carp. Uh, the fish on the very bottom has, has a bigger head um, that's the big head carp. And the one there in, in the middle uh, with, with larger scales, it eats grass. So of course we call it a, gra a grass carp. Um, I, I do note the average sizes in our river today, but all these fish are minnows, but you can see they can get quite big between 65 and 100 pounds. Um, so very big minnows. So also, I'd like to show the, the fourth of those species, a black carp. Now, this was a 115-pounder caught on the Mississippi River. These are very uh, low in abundance currently, but you can see they were introduced after, after big head and silver carp to manage snails. Uh, the next slide, please. And this is the way we see them most often uh, in, in Illinois, in, in the Midwest is when these silver carp, now the most dominant uh, of, of the Asian carps in, in the wild, uh, start jumping out of the water. We've seen videos of people pursuing them, seeing them from the boat. This was a, just running a boat through an area um, where they were very abundant. So you can see silver carp jumping out of the water. Um, in areas like this, silver carp can be uh, in excess of 70% of the total biomass. Next slide. Now the interesting position is, is, as we see them as nuisance, and they are, they compete with our native resources, but perhaps the rest of the world sees them much differently. 
and, and these are just some um, locations uh, here in Illinois, uh, generally, uh, to, to the left, uh, the University of Illinois, that shows uh, that they can be high-quality food, and it has been served in uh, University of Illinois dining halls, restaurants across the state. Uh, the middle uh, bottom picture shows a Springfield, Illinois uh, fish shack, which um, serves them up like like any uh, Friday night fish fry, uh, a, a boneless fillet. So they're they're quite delicious, and we think this is uh, something we can utilize to help remove them from the water and get us to a more equitable balance because they're spread out so much. Uh, the, the two pictures to the right are from China, uh, Wuhan actually. I know it's a uh, we can see restaurants exploit this. They're they're very well uh, received. And China has a workforce designed over thousands of years uh, to capture Asian carp in, in very large uh, ecosystems. Next slide. Well, we have a workforce here in Illinois too. Commercial fishing has been very vital over the last 150 years, <clears throat> removing uh, uh, fish from the Illinois River, once considered probably the third most successful fisheries in North America. Um, freshwater fisheries, that is, and so the Great Lakes, the Columbia River, and frankly, the Illinois River back uh, the t between 18, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, were removing lots of fish, and uh, we think they can help us manage these fish in Illinois, uh, not only to reduce their impacts, but also to prevent their spread. Uh, so here you see very ac various activities by our fishermen, often called carp cowboys, uh, corralling the fish, actually driving them like cattle at times, using sound uh, to push them into corners of lakes where they can be more susceptible uh, to gears like gill nets or seines. Um, Monterey Bay Seafood Watch has evaluated uh, these commercial fishing methods uh, for uh, big head and silver carp in Illinois, and it, they say it's a good choice. So. Sustainable is the fact that it's not affecting uh, negatively those other native fish, and we're removing a, a, a threat. So it's a win-win. Next slide. And I do need to step back a little bit because we have a couple key partnerships. I already mentioned the, the Great Lakes governors and premiers uh, have supported this, and, and we're looking into, frankly, the utilization of this food with some interesting uh, partners in Iceland who revolutionized the cod fishery. Um, but a lot of our boots on the ground effort in Illinois to prevent their spread is our Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee, or ACRCC. Um, this is a, a compendium of 27 U.S. and Canadian federal, state, provincial, and regional institutions formed in 2010 to attack this specific issues, keep the fish from the Great Lakes. Um, it's co-chaired by the U.S. EPA and Fish and Wildlife Service. Work very closely, of course, with Congress for funding uh, to get the necessary uh, funding we, uh, to do this work. We have a monitoring response work group, which is really guiding day-to-day -day activities when we're in the, in the field. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those uh, here coming up. And we do annual action plans for the ACRCC and develop annual work plans to guide those in-field activities. Um, State of Illinois uh, and the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission chair the monitoring response support group. Uh, part of our efforts here in the last couple of years was really jump-starting this business analysis to see if it's possible that the businesses can help us out. Next slide. So part of our monitoring response plan is based on really three tenets. Uh, detection. We've got to determine where the fish are, where they aren't. Uh, we have to, to manage and control those fish. Uh, where they are, we need to prevent that upstream passage towards Lake Michigan. And we, we're trying to use every tool in a toolbox. We're using barriers. We're using this mass removal, uh, contracting with fishermen to remove it. Um, and we're, under, we're trying to understand the best, best uh, methods for prevent, preventing passage at other locations where barriers aren't uh, currently uh, present. And finally, we have a response component. So we try uh, planning to make sure uh, we have all the comprehensive procedures in place in case we're surprised at, at various locations uh, and we can respond quickly. Next slide. So the overall uh, strategy for the detection, managed control, and contingency response also can uh, collate to, to three different areas here in Illinois. Um, if you're not familiar with Illinois, Chicago's up on the southern part of Lake Michigan, and the Illinois River and the waterway um, 
is connected through canals of Chicago, and that Illinois River then flows into the Mississippi River just north of St. Louis. Uh, so that's on the map on the left. So from from upstream to downstream, our, our first focus is in the cause of Chicago area waterways. And this is where we do find barriers, three sets of repetitive barriers that are in the canals. Uh, we do a lot of detection and monitoring. Uh, we go in the spring and the fall and hit the waters with uh, uh, over 300 sites uh, in each season to make sure, in multiple gears, electrofishing, netting, um, and we even do uh, detection with environmental DNA. Uh, to make sure there's nothing present and, and currently only two fish have been found uh, in, in that area and those were swiftly removed. So, the, so then we go, trans, uh, go, we go below the electric barriers um, in, the, in the cause and, and this is the upper river area, the, the red circle. And this is where uh, we do detect larval eggs and uh, small fish occasionally. We see spawning uh, below that line that says Dresden on it, uh, but those eggs then move downstream into the Peoria pool, into the Lagrange pool farther downriver before they become, uh, frankly, small fish. That's the nature of these Asian carps, spawning right in the middle of the, the river. Uh, we also keep a very close eye on the detectable population front. Uh, at the top of this, just below what, what says Brandon, which is a Brandon Road lock and dam, um, we think that's the, the northernmost detectable front. Uh, we don't find fish upstream of Brandon Road. I've never found fish uh, in Brandon Road pool. And um, so we keep a very keen eye to what fish are doing there. We do a lot of harvest uh, removal from this area. Uh, last year, uh, it was over 1.2, almost 1.3 million pounds removed. That has uh, changed since 2012. The population of, of this reach of the river uh, downwards 95 percent so so less than five percent of those fish uh, the density of those fish remains in that dresden island pool we think it's really important to prevent their spread and we're, and we're bringing modeling and, and science to help make us decisions especially in this and most of our work really has been focused from from this red circle above starved rock lock and band uh, lock and dam towards lake michigan um, i do want to talk a little bit today about the lower river this is where we have independent commercial fishing. This is the big green circle. Uh, we understand our modeling tells us that removing fish from this area can help incrementally prevent them from getting close to that Brandon Road pool. In fact, enough removal below, we believe the, the, the opportunity to get to near, near zero uh, percent chance of them reaching Brandon Road is possible. Um, so the relationship of harvest downstream and upstream is, is really important. So we're evaluating the use of harvest there with those commercial fishermen. Um, all these things together work as, as a model. In our other large rivers, the Mississippi, the Ohio, these types of strategies are being implemented in some sort or fashion. Next slide. As everybody knows, in, in, in 2020, COVID-19 um, uh, affected what we did in the field. We were able to do nearly all of our scheduled work with our little hiatus uh, between uh, February and early May. Um, probably don't need to talk about COVID-19. We were really concerned about social distancing. We had some shelter in place, uh, orders in place early, but we were, were able to get out in a modified um, working condition uh, May 1st. We started working with our commercial fishermen from an observation boat instead of jumping on their boats. Um, nonetheless, uh, we were able to do that with decontaminating our, our boats on a daily basis. Uh, we had contingency response plans in place and supported if something did pop on the radar, we could have jumped into action um, and various partners stepped up, maybe did a little bit more in 2020 than what they had planned on just to get the job done. So very appreciative of staff who uh, donned their masks and, and did the work. This is a, a walleye from uh, near Lake Michigan in some of that seasonal intensive monitoring we do in the cause. Next slide. So, so this slide should say detection in the upper left, and that is that work in the seasonal uh, intensive monitoring near Chicago. We do, um, we were able to get out on the water in the spring, uh, even with COVID, but instead of doing some of the electrofishing where we have staff very closely together, we uh, 
double down on those commercial nettings, the, the best way to catch the big fish. And uh, so we covered the waterway that way. A, a modification, but, but one that we uh, were able to keep very safe. Um, Downriver, we did detection work uh, using multi-agencies and multi-gear. Frankly, some agencies were not able to participate in 2020. Um, but we were flexible enough. We were able to get all that work done. And nothing really has, has changed uh, over time. We didn't see any uh, major changes in, in 2020. Uh, and our research groups from the universities were able to get on the water to look at eggs, larval, and small fish as, as they do every year. Next slide. When it comes to managing control, uh, we did have that hiatus until May, uh, but we have two uh, removal options that contract fishing, where we hire the fishermen to work for us in the upper river. Um, and I, I mentioned we did get about 1.3 million pounds removed. And we also have uh, enhanced contract fishing. So this is taking advantage of those commercial fishermen uh, that work in the rest of the state. We actually dangle a little bit of a carrot, 10 cents a pound, if they come to Peoria Pool, which is that next pool downriver from our focus management area. And if they can come there, we know they can help us by removing fish. And where the whole river, uh, the Illinois River below Starved Rock is, is open to commercial harvest and generally gets four to uh, four million pounds out uh, per year, fishermen in 2020 were able to target Peoria Pool and took three million pounds out um, and this graphic just kind of shows us by taking the more abundant fish uh, out of the lower river, we are preventing them from getting to the upper river. And we can see a, a new balance coming. Perhaps in the future, we can do less work in the upper river and allow our commercial harvest downstream to remove those fish for us. I call it mop-up work. Maybe, maybe in a few years, uh, that balance can, can work towards our advantage. Next slide. So the contract fishing below, this is our, this is when we hire the uh, commercial fishermen. And as the picture suggests, uh, we do take out a lot. We have semi trucks show up. We load them into bins and, and use a tractor, load them up on the truck. Those fish are not for human consumption. Our goal here is to maximize removal, but it does go, uh, we do allow them to go into fish meal, fish oil, uh, fish fertilizers. Um, in 2020, 1 .2, over 1.2 million pounds were removed. You can see the numbers of individual fish, certainly dominated by silver carp today. Um, and we've seen no advance of that Asian carp population front in the Illinois waterway. That's number one, that's, that's our goal. And we use unified fishing events. I'll talk to them later on if people are interested, uh, but we target areas, we fish as a team. Uh, we learned this from our Chinese uh, fishing brethren, uh, and, and we can be very effective working as a team, much more than the individual parts, by be basically being carp cowboys and pushing them into nets and taking advantage of their uh, behavior to move away from sound and noise. So we actually target certain areas throughout the year. And that's been a big tool for us, just from one lake over a two-week time period, you can see over 200,000 pounds uh, removed. Next slide. So I mentioned this enhanced contract fishing, and I wanted to throw this uh, graphic up, the yellow circle, showing where in the world, where in Illinois we're talking about, that's that Peoria pool. It's below our, in our uh, management zone, uh, the red circle, what we call the upper river. So this is uh, the way to get the at-large commercial fishermen to help with us for a management purpose uh, to reduce the population, and we know those efforts will prevent fish from uh, going upstream. Next slide. Those enhanced contract fishing uh, efforts to date have removed 3.3 million pounds since being launched in the fall of 2019, 2.8 million pounds in 2020. And uh, I, I mentioned that we provided a contracted incentive for those fishermen to do this work of 10 cents per pound. And, and that we believe is, is the best way to manage and control, uh, one of the best ways uh, to, to manage and control that. It helps pr uh, prevent the fish from getting to the upper river where Frankly, we are the last line of, of defense. Our, our uh, short-term goal is, is to get that Peoria pool number up to about 8 million pounds per year. Uh, we believe the whole Illinois River could uh, remove 20 to 50 million pounds annually, and that would really change the demographics of the fish and the percentage of the fish, um, specifically Asian carp, um, in that neck of the woods, helping us manage this. 
Next slide. So a couple of ways we utilize technology. Uh, we use telemetry, tagging with a radio, a sonic tag or a radio tag, uh, a fish. And knowing where those fish go is, is very helpful to know the habitats. When are they in the backwaters? When are they in the main channel? Um, and we also use hydroacoustics. Hydroacoustics can tell us where the abundance of fish are. And I, I said these are minnows, but they're some of the largest fish in our waters. So by doing some basic science and correlation, we can predict where big head and silver carp are. And this helps guide our own efforts. And we believe it can also help guide uh, commercial fishing in, in the lower Illinois River. We can say, well, have you tried this lake? Have you tried this location? We have noticed fish there. And we do this on a day-to-day -day basis in the upper Illinois River. We think it's really important to both inform fishers, managers, and our model, modelers. Um, the, the graphic is, is a bar uh, through time for each of the downriver pools and relative abundance of fish. So we have seen a decrease uh, across the board, uh, but we have a lot of work to do. Next slide. So some of the challenges in, in trying to get people to eat or otherwise remove this fish is, uh, first of all, what's in a name? But a carp is a four-letter word uh, if you like to eat fish. Uh, and someone says carp, many of us don't go, wow, great. Uh, it has a bad name. Uh, common carp, this fish that was brought into North America in the 1880s, uh, is a bottom feeder. That eats down in the mud, eats the insects, um, disrupt ecosystems but also has a stronger flavor uh, than our big head or silver carp. Common carp is well known, uh, not only to our, our European ancestors, uh, but also because of this strong taste. They, I put up air quotes, it's a bottom feeder uh, or grandpa's carp. That's what people understand carp as being. Next slide. So and the challenge is you got to have to educate people on what is a, a big head or a silver carp. It's not a bottom feeder. It's not grandpa's carp. You know, when I talk, especially to kids and sometimes uh, adults, when I say, have you ever tried eating it? Oh, yeah, grandpa used to catch these all the time. And we used to do this, this, and this. So immediately people don't understand. This is kind of a novel fish. Um, so there's a little education that has to happen. Um, I do start talking about those four Asian carp species, give them that little understanding. But, you know, it's a light, flaky, nutritious uh, flesh. It's really delicious. I compare it to uh, crappie. Uh, when pr prepared correctly, uh, it's, it's, it's delicious, but it's also the right thing to do ecologically, removing an invasive uh, fish as opposed to eating some of the ones that uh, we're really trying to manage. There is an opportunity uh, to rebrand this, and we have some of those things underway. We, we hope to have a launch of those efforts in 2021. Um, probably the end of June already, uh, as it comes up really quickly now. Next slide. In having that talk about Asian carp, you know, these are not bottom feeders. It's always good to talk about what they do eat. They eat the zooplankton and phytoplankton. And that's why they do their damage to our uh, native fish. It's because they're eating those resources that all small fish need. Um, very few, we have a few uh, fish in Illinois, gizzard shad, uh, big mouth buffalo that also eat these resources. Um, but here you can see a bunch of silver carp just um, on the surface of the water, filtering out uh, the green algae, uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton. They do that with highly specialized gill rakers. They can do it better than our native fish. And for the layman, when they talk about what do they eat, I say it's the stuff that's green in the water. So that's why I've got my little two liter green goo. Next slide. It's also important to say it, it's more than just an issue with the Great Lakes. It, it's the focus of what we do in Illinois. We have to protect the, uh, the Great Lakes. We have to reduce the abundance in our large rivers. But this map from uh, USGS data shows these Asian carps really are a national problem. In all of our large rivers, you can clearly see with the, the green and, and yellow dots and uh, triangles is throughout our large rivers, and frankly, things like grass carp are throughout the country. So the focus of most of our work or the scope is, is this Illinois River corridor, about 240 miles, as a demonstration of what we can do, both to prevent their spread out of the area, but then uh, to overfish them, 
again, thinking up to about 50 million pounds to, can come out of this to meet some protein needs, uh, healthy choices uh, for food. And frankly, there's a historic fishing identity in, in this basin, and it goes all the way down the Mississippi River Basin as well. Next slide. Some of these talking points, when we talk about utilizing this fish, um, it's a healthy choice. It's a nutritious fish. It's a great source of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, it, it's fresh and clean. Um, if you've had this to eat, you, you would uh, back me up. But it's a top freshwater fish, top feeding freshwater fish, very low in contaminants. It's not a predator. It's not uh, bioaccumulating um, like some fish. And certainly uh, healthier in a lot of ways than tuna, cod, and orange roughy, things that are known to uh, accelerate and uh, bring on contaminants. Next slide. And, and this is a, a slide of, of mercury concentrations in fillets. And, and you can just see the comparisons between orange roughy, which is a long-lived fish that can really uh, be high in mercury, um, but also things like canned tuna. You see big head and silver carp on the far left with, in the red circle, uh, farm-raised catfish on the far right, very low in, in, in mercury. And so, again, a, a healthy choice. Uh, next slide. I guess this is just a, a general statement, you know, I capture it as eat well, do good. But, but I think we're at a key moment to develop some public-private partnerships. We're really trying to solve this problem, reduce the, the Asian carp threat, prevent their spread. But there is an economic marketing strategy to help industry do this, um, as opposed to just focusing at the upper part of this and not managing the population. It becomes very expensive when, when you broaden into the Mississippi River Basin. So we need a partner here. Next slide. I hope this looks good to you, an arugula salad over some smoked Asian carp, but the University of Illinois has been serving this for mul multiple years, uh, serving up to about 50,000 pounds of this um, on campus, a very international campus where, uh, uh, frankly, some of the fish is served with the bones in because that's the way people are familiar with it um, from their home. Um, but but there are other ways we can remove bones as far as grinding or, or making value-added products. So they're looking at all of these things. The University of Illinois says um, they can serve Asian carp at a dollar a pound cheaper than tilapia, which is their next most affordable white fish on campus. And it's locally sourced um, and maybe even more nutritious. So we think there's a lot of good things to talk about uh, when we think about managing this species to prevent their spread but also doing good. Next slide, another talking point that uh, this marketing firm has come up with us is sustainably wild, surprisingly delicious. Um, if you like a fish fry, you would like to eat some Asian carp, it's sustainable, not because we're trying to manage for Asian carp, but by removing them is, is the right choice to sustain our native, native species. The independent, I'm sorry, the next slide should be downstream management. It shows a little blue book. I may have skipped a, a, a slide. But uh, we've got a branding toolkit um, that our marketers have put together that will really offer this type of communication tools to fish markets, uh, grocery stores, uh, producers of other uh, uh, fish products, so we can talk in a really good way uh, and not fall back into the carps of four-letter word. So we're trying to provide that is actually very achievable when you get really smart people working with you. Next slide. So of our three major tenants, the last one we haven't talked about is our response. And, and I'll just walk through an example from 2019, but we have to be prepared for things to pop up when you don't expect it. So uh, for emergency responders, they have a planning P, and that's what I've got in the far right corner of the slide. Um, to show how we respond to incidents or emergencies, how we bring people together, very organized way to execute a plan to, um, to alleviate the threat. So in this case, we're doing annual routine sampling of eDNA in the Chicago region. And this was in 2019. I was actually vacationing in Tobermory, Ontario. Um, and, and the crew was calling me up. And it, this was after we did some work in September, 
and uh, we did an intense work. They went out and looked for eDNA, and they went to about 300 uh, sites, and they found incredible amounts. Nearly every uh, sample was positive in, in about a mile or two area of Bubbly Creek, uh, just outside of downtown Chicago. Which is really strange. We don't even get that many positives where we have huge abundances of fish farther down the river. So obviously we, we had to organize a response. In the first couple of weeks of November, and so there were some weather constraints, but we went out there and five miles surrounding this, we blanketed it with electric fishing and, and netting. We encountered some DO levels where nothing, uh, where there's no DO at all, and nothing was swimming, and these were areas where we were high in uh, carp detections. This is also an area where there's a, um, uh, a sewer outfall in, in periods of high rain, there's a little overflow. So after not seeing Asian carp, we began investigating to what provided this eDNA uh, positives. And, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service did a lot of work to work with the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Chicago. But, but the bottom line was we found eDNA coming from the sewers. Um, and in this time of overflow, we were able to detect it in the river. So we had an a strange and alarming uh, action in our river, it wasn't carp, it was from this other source. Now we're developing our, our sampling to avoid this area, um, also keep track of when there are uh, releases, emergency uh, releases that, that might create this situation again. So very trying couple weeks because it was saying something was really going on and thankfully we had no carp threat, um, but we learned a lot about eDNA. Next slide. And this is my final slide. This is uh, available on AsianCarp.us, and it's basically our, our status map uh, of showing where carp are, where carp aren't. I'm going to work from the bottom left uh, up towards Lake Michigan, and that is that Peoria pool, about 102 miles away from uh, Lake Michigan. We see all life stages. We see eggs, larvae, small fish, and adults uh, spawning fish in Peoria pool. As we go up river and starved rock, we don't see those smallest fish, except when the eggs and larvae are, are, are going down the main channel, we, they don't grow up there. So it's a different color. Um, again, in Marseilles, yellow is, is where we do see uh, an upstream extent of some spawning in Marseilles pool, but those eggs and larvae do need to float for uh, a couple days and they get down into Peoria pool. Be, before they're, quote, fish and swim out to the, to the margins of the river. And finally, that Dresden Island pool in green is that leading edge. That's the up, upward extent where we can actually reliably go catch fish. Uh, the population there is down 95 to 97 percent than where it was in 2012, largely from these removal efforts. And then we do a lot of work upstream of there to make sure uh, rare fish don't exist. And we have found two in the blue area above the electric dispersal barrier, uh, one in 2010, a big head carp. And the very first day we used commercial fishermen to help us do this work. And then in 2017, um, about nine miles from Lake Michigan, we found a, a silver carp. And in all those cases, we had multiple weak responses to make sure there was nothing else and nothing else was found. But for those interested, that is available on asiancarp.us under what, what is the problem. I think I'll stop there. I, I covered lots of things about solutions, uh, about our current activities, and maybe there is a question uh, that I can answer at this time. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, I don't know if you wanted to go over this slide now. Um, we have a question that's come through, but if we wanted to give it another minute, you, you had some time to go over this if you want. Sure, I've got one more slide uh, to present. And again, um, if you open that up and you click on it, there is a little play button in the bottom left-hand corner. If you hit that play button, um, I'll go ahead and annotate this a little bit. Um, I put it in as a PDF, so I'm gonna have to try and open it as a PowerPoint. Oops. Hold 
So what this graphic does show is some of our oh. unified fishing. This, this is several miles of the Desplaines River and the Kankakee River. Just let me know when you hit play. It is in my email, so I'm not going to be able to hit play. Unfortunately, I didn't realize that it was animated. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Uh, so it was a, it was a, it was a graphic made by question. USGS. Sure, sure, let's do that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, so the first question that we have is, do you think that by marketing Asian carp health benefits and promoting their consumption, will that promote the need slash want for continued reproductive success? Yeah, so so we know they're very successful. Now, contrary to popular, it's not like they're spawn every year today. Um, we see successful spawning on the Illinois River probably every um, three to four years. But we do expect some uh, density dependent uh, interactions. Right now they're so abundant, they're growing extremely slow. I guess my hope is that uh, we see uh, just few fish out there. They'll be growing faster, they'll be fatter, more robust, their eggs might be healthier, but the overall abundance, instead of being 70% of the biomass, the goal is we think we can overfish them. They've overfished them in rivers like the Yangtze River in China where they're native. So if we focus on reducing the population to 20% of where they are today, uh, it becomes a win-win. Overall, it's, fewer, it's lower biomass, um, and we have people to do that good work. If we don't do anything, we have main, we, these fish can maintain extremely high abundances, uh, which, which are impacting our native fish. So we've seen this almost as the essential thing to do uh, in our large rivers, but also be very... Uh, uh, reticent on where barriers have to be placed um, and identify other other tools uh, in certain waters. But in our large rivers, we have to develop some, some major removal. Okay, great. The next question is, how do you persuade private interest in investing in harvesting Asian carp when there's going to be no long-term growth in the industry? Is our aim to fish them into extirpation? That is a great question. And we have those discussions. And while uh, extirpation is a noble goal, um, you know, I often talk in, in terms of, of the scope of the, the problem from the Appalachians to the Rockies, from Minnesota to uh, New Orleans. These things are in all the tributaries in between. It's an unbelievable issue. Um, I think we can extirpate it from all those areas. I think extirpation is, is good in those critical areas, at the leading edges, in those pools that we identify, if they get into lakes and, and uh, places locally. Understanding how to extirpate something on that magnitude is, is difficult. We haven't done it with any of the other 180 species, I don't think, across the Great Lakes. Um, I guess we'll hold that. I, but we have to do something between now and then. Uh, I, I say we think there's 20 to 50 million pounds to be removed from the Illinois River, but that's annually. Um, some years might be higher, some years may be lower, but it, it, it takes a lot, a lot of work rolling up our sleeves. It's going to take a, an industrial response to, to change this dynamic. Okay, great. Um, the next question is, are you seeing any hybridization between any of the Asian carp species, or even between any Asian carp species and like native species. Yes, great question. We have seen uh, significant hybridization between big-headed carp and silver carp. Um, there, there's a longer history here, but the, even uh, just 10 years ago, the majority of the fish we took out of the Upper Illinois River were big-head carp. 90% of them are, were large big-head carp, and through fishing, we've been able to get rid of the the, the largest fish. Um, and the small and are left with a bunch of silver carp. But of those, frankly, about 70% of them are some type of, of, of mutt or hybrid. Uh, they, they often are going into the same areas for spawning, and uh, it seems like it, uh, 
you're more likely to get a, a hybrid out there than actually a pure big head or a pure silver carp. And, and I think that's uh, throughout the, the range, we're seeing hybrids everywhere. Thanks for the question. Hey, um, the next question is, yeah, um, the next question is, what can you speak to any of the changes in biodiversity of native species as a result of um, the invasion? Sure, sure, I can. Um, we we haven't seen extirpations, right? You know, so there are impacts. Uh, I've done some work um, in my prior life as a research biologist instead of an administrator. Oh, for the day. Um, but working on the rivers, looking at things like gizzer chad and big mouth buffalo, those things that compete directly for food, uh, we we have seen declines in overall abundance. We've seen um, smaller fish, obviously, and then thinner fish, uh, between five and and ten percent change in relative weights. So that's real in a fish world. You know, a, a big fat fish is healthy um, at five to ten percent de uh, decrease health uh, their eggs aren't quite as good they might be more susceptible to, to disease so we we have seen that um for those that dire uh, directly compete now some things like channel catfish uh we've seen either no effect or maybe even a slight pick up uh might, might want to consider what uh what silver carp excrete coming to the bottom of the river and uh, enriching the sediment so silver carp poop, if you would, might be enriching the, the benthic environment and allowing some uh, advantage to some benthic fishes. Um, it's not totally clear, uh, but that there is some people working on that idea that um, some fish are taking advantage of that. And because they're small minnows, they don't have spines. They are food for things like white bass, blue catfish have been known to feed on uh, uh, small silver carp. And, and some not so small. So there are local advantages, uh, but it is affecting the overall population of those that are, uh, have the most similar feeding strategies. Thank you. The next question oh, is, um, you spoke about your, yeah, <laughs> you, you spoke about your uh, relationships with some commercial fishermen. Have they expressed any um, of the economic impact that they've seen like as an industry, as a result of the Asian carp invasion. Yes, yes, and you know, for early on. So the first spawning took place on the Illinois River uh, in earnest in 2000. We didn't see any small fish before that. Uh, there, there was a large, uh, a, an increasing number of fish showing up in the catches through the 1990s, and and the fishermen had no place. You know, no one were buying them then. It's a new fish. Um, it's still challenging to sell. But yet these fish are strong and large and they tear up a lot of gear. So it's a love-hate relationship. Um, for those who can sell uh, the fish, they can catch them in large numbers. And some have been able to um, do very well, taking advantage of that. For others that are looking for more historic fish, uh, channel catfish are, are buffalo species, are, are historic targets. Um, they're going through gear, so it makes fishing more expensive because these larger fish are tearing up uh, the lighter nets necessary to, to catch the native species. Um, so, so there is some appreciation for um, a market being established because generally these guys are conservationists. They, they understand the relationship that's going on in the river. Uh, a lot of people have families that have, have done this and they want to do the best thing for the river. So harvesting these, they're, they're all for it. Um, but, but it has impacted their day-to-day. -day. They've had to adapt. Thank you. The next question is, it's a bit of a, a comment slash question. Um, the history of harvesting common carp is if 80% or plus of the population is not removed, the fish biodensity increases. My guess is that the removal for big-headed carp is a higher percentage. If aquaculture workers cannot remove over 98% of the same size catfish from a rectangular flat bottom three acre pond, why would we expect harvesters, harvesters to achieve success in a varying dimension river fast current impediment bottom jumping fish? Great question. And 
I'll take a stab at it, but, but this is, this is the, the part of what we're doing. Evidence shows that throughout the world, these guys are very susceptible to, to fishing. Uh, let's, call, let's talk about the big head carp. They have a big head. It's very prone to being caught as, as opposed to perhaps the, the common carp. Um, we also have a fish that's very linked into the hydrological cycle of large rivers, not just a backwater or, or a lake. They, if we don't have a flood pulse timed at the right time, we can't get a spawn off. So there's multiple things we can take advantage of um, in years of high reproduction versus years, some years we know they just aren't going to uh, reproduce. Now it's not easy, it's gonna take a lot of effort, um, but the evidence does, does suggest that uh, this, in combination with those other tools of barriers at appropriate locations, and, and we're doing some research into what that looks like, um, that I, I believe it's gonna be a huge tool to help us out. Um, and we're monitoring. I didn't explain that, but, but as we deploy these tools, we did a fishing experiment um, just oh gosh, seven, eight years ago, removal of three million pounds from the lower Illinois River. There was notable demographic effects. The larger fish were gone, the sex ratios changed because it got more females than males. So it was pushing uh, the static population in the right direction. And that maintained itself through the, through the next year. Um, so if you have significant back-to-back -back fishing, increased landings, we do believe there, there's a, an advantage to be taken. We'll be watching it closely. Obviously, we have concerns as well. The next question is, is it illegal in Illinois to keep live Asian carp in fish markets? It is, it is. So, so specifically big head carp, silver carp. Uh, grass carp, we allow triploids to be held because there's, there's been a long standing uh, desire for those, but not from the wild. They have to come from production facilities and have all the testing. But um, you know, fishermen, when they remove those fish, they have to be dead. Uh, when sold at markets, they can't be uh, alive. So it is illegal to, to hold live big head or silver carp in Illinois. They're, they're injurious species, both in Illinois and, and nationally. Okay, the next question is, could you highlight the work that will happen at Brandon Road Lock and Dam with expected funding. Sure, and, and I'll step back a little bit from a lot of the details. Um, Illinois, um, and it's just it currently in the news, uh, has entered an agreement, a uh, pre-engineering and design agreement with the Corps of Engineers for a project at Brandon Road Lock and Dam. The idea is that an additional barrier, um, currently outlined by the Corps, is having electricity, um, maybe some flushing, um, multiple technologies that could be placed there could assist with any fish that may want to pass. At that location, only fish can go through the lock. Um, there's no opportunity for them to go around it. Um, so we've entered in an agreement and we've got a great partner in Michigan who also said they're come to the table and share some resources and helping us to come up with that right solution. And that's kind of where we are today. Um, we have a proposed project and we're walking arm in arm with our partners to, to, to get that um, evaluated and see what we can put in the water. Okay, great. And the last question is, um, you mentioned the four types of Asian carps. Should we be concerned about black carp spread? Yeah, we should be. So you saw how large it gets. It eats mussels and snails, and one at 115 pounds can eat almost any mussel or snail in the river. It's still low abundance. Unfortunately, we are seeing reproduction in the middle Mississippi River Basin, uh, think around St. Louis area, and um, it's just unfortunate. Again, brought over to manage snails, which is a, a pest in aquaculture. And, and leads to some uh, uh, wormy type in infections in the fish, making them not very acceptable. This biological control made a lot of sense, but they got out of the barn and they're in the river. Uh, 
in the Illinois River itself, which is that connectivity of the Great Lakes. We've only got a handful, less than 10, I believe. Um, one thing Illinois does is we give a bounty, $100 per fish since 2015, because frankly, agencies weren't finding these fish. We weren't getting any reports of them. So we we're trying to figure, we knew they were being caught by commercial harvesters. So we said, give us your black carp, we'll give you $100. And our detection rates went up through the roof and uh, we're starting to understand a little bit more about the biology. So. They're another species. We believe the same type of controls that we're putting on big head and silver carp will be applicable to uh, black carp. But uh, yeah, it's unfortunate when these invasive species get a hold because they're really hard to get to manage in these large rivers. Okay, um, I was able to get that that slide up while we were doing some of the questions. So if you would like to go over it now, I can press play. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. And this is kind of exciting. I uh, made a couple trips to uh, uh, China to figure out how are they fishing. And this is one way, if you hit play, you'll see some blue lights light up as this is playing. And those blue lights are our boats. And you'll see how, how they're moving uh, throughout. This is the Kankakee River at first, and then uh, another crew is working on the Des Plaines River um, as they come together forming the Illinois. You'll see where they put out the yellow lines. Those are nets and gears. And they're working in a very organized fashion. We call it a unified fishing because they're working as one team unified on this method. And not only are we catching them along the way, but we're also driving them down river from right to left, from upstream to downstream. Um, and if you probably can't see, those, those big dots start showing up. The, the bigger the dot, the bigger the catches. We almost always catch more larger catches at the bottom of these drives, if you will. Uh, I believe in, in this one day's worth of work, uh, we caught over 200 fish. So um, this is something we're deploying more often, working as a team. It's, it's a, we often throw an electrofishing boat in there to help uh, our commercial fishers. We use block netting at times to prevent fish from going up into creeks and channels and to otherwise funnel them to our uh, capture gear. Um, a unique way we're using our tools and our that we have in, in our hand all at once to capture fish and, and do so very um, effectively. In some of our backwater lakes, we actually can show that we've removed 80% of the Asian carp in a given backwater lake using this technique over uh, one or two weeks. Thank, thanks for getting that going. I hope that was a nice graphic and kudos to the USGS for able to put that together. Yeah, thanks for thanks for sharing that. That was awesome. Um, I'm glad I was able to to get it up. Um, so with that, that is all the time we have for for questions. So again, thank you so much to Kevin for presenting today, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. Um, just a reminder to please take a couple minutes to fill out our survey. That'll pop up at the end of the webinar, and it'll also be emailed to you um, tomorrow in a follow up email. Uh, we also have three more webinars coming up. So uh, the first one will be on the 4th, and that's an update on ca uh, Canada's Asian Carp Detection Surveillance Program and Response Actions, and then another Asian Carp-themed uh, webinar on February 7th that I will actually be presenting um, on some of our outreach initiatives and education outreach with partners. And then lastly, we'll have one on February 25th, which um, is a part of our Invasive Species Center webinar series. Uh, assessing the risk of oak wilt in Canada. So you can tune uh, into any of those if you're interested and register at uh, invasivespeciescenter.ca. So thank you again to everyone uh, and take good care.